Hi, everybody. I'm Ashwin. And I'm Eri. This is Blood Cancer Talks. This is a podcast exclusively dedicated to hematologic malignancies, where we bring content experts who live and breathe a particular disease and focus on the latest advances in biology and clinical management. Today, we are excited to talk about management of anemia in lower-risk MDS, discussing specifically about some of the recent FDA approvals, including Lospatacept and most recently, Imtilistat. We have an expert, Dr. Maximilian Stahl. He's a member of the Adult Leukemia Group at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Stahl, thank you so much for joining and thank you for your time. Before we can start, can you tell us about yourself, your clinical and research focus for our listeners? Sure. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for uh, having me, Ashwin and Eddie. I'm happy to be here. Um, yeah, so a little bit about my background. I uh, I did my medical school in Germany and um, and then wanted to do one year of research in the U.S., but, uh, but out of that became now 14 years plus and counting. Um, I met my wife here as American, and she did not want to uh, come to Germany, so that was the end of it. And then I did my residency at uh, Yale New Haven Hospital in Connecticut. Um, I met my first mentor there who was focused on MDS, uh, Steve Gore and um, Amr Seiden. I then went on to fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering, but I stuck with leukemia and MDS and then took my first faculty job at Dana-Farber after finishing fellowship. And I've been in Boston now for about three years. With that, uh, let us jump right in. So we'll start with the case. And you can walk us through how you would approach this patient and we can discuss the clinical trials uh, as we go. This patient is a 68-year-old man uh, with no significant past medical history. He presented uh, with the symptoms of fatigue and dyspnea on exertion. Uh, a complete blood count evaluation was done, which showed a white count of 4.8 a hemoglobin of 8.3, and a platelet count of 394,000. Extensive workup for anemia was done, including nutritional deficiencies, all where came back as negative. Uh, after this extensive evaluation, the patient had a bone marrow biopsy to further evaluate for this anemia, uh, which showed a moderately hypercellular marrow 60 to 70% cellularity with trilineage hematopoiesis. There is mild megakaryocytic atypia in the setting of borderline thrombocytosis. Iron staining was done, which showed abundant ring blast more than 50%. There is no increase in blast by morphology uh, by and reported flow cytometry as well. And the genomic markers showed normal karyotype. And the Mylard NGS panel showed SF3B1 mutation with a variant frequency of 22.9%. So, Max, a patient like this who presents to your clinic for further management, how would you approach a new diagnosis of presumably MDS, uh, given the bone marrow findings as well as the mutation testing? Um, can you please uh, walk us through your thought process and is there any other diagnostic test you would order? And uh, and we'll focus our discussion on the management, mostly for this patient. Sure, yeah. So let me maybe just start with what I usually say to my fellows when they see such a new patient in a clinic with me. I think there's really, really three components to any MDS patient, including the lower risk or the higher risk patients. Um, the first thing is to confirm the diagnosis. Um, the second important item is to get a good prognostication of the patient. And then based on those two things, confirming the diagnosis and um, establishing a, a prognostic outlook for the patient is to uh, form a therapeutic plan. So let's start with just confirming the diagnosis. So what you want to do is I think, obviously this was worked up, this patient was worked up by Ashwin, so expertly, I assume. Um, so if everything was done just um, as I would have done it. Too important, I think here is that um, mimickers of MDS were ruled out, so nutritional deficiencies were ruled out, um, a bone marrow biopsy was obtained, and, um, and dysplasia, morphologic dysplasia was established. 
And then also what was important, clonality was found. So really the, the combination of morphologic dysplasia and clonality by this SF3B1 mutation that is present, I think makes a, makes a diagnosis of MDS. So that's important. And I would always encourage people to review the bone marrow slides uh, themselves. We usually, when we see patients, we have the slides come to us uh, for a second review. Um, so once that is done, it's really uh, to uh, establish the prognosis of the patient. And um, when I explain this to patients, I always try to explain that when you have MDS in front of you, you try to match the intensity of the treatment based on the prognosis of the patient. So you really don't want to expose a patient to potentially toxic treatments if that is not needed because they have lower risk MDS. On the other hand, you don't want to undertreat patients. So you don't want to give them, you know, a low risk treatment when they have higher risk disease. So I think prognostication is really the first step of therapy and it's an integral part of picking the right therapy. And I think in this case, there are a couple like lower risk features, I would say. Number one is that the patient just has an isolated anemia. Um, the patient does not have thrombocytopenia or leukopenia. The patient does not have increased blasts in the bone marrow. The patient has a normal karyotype, which is good. And the patient has actually the only mutation in MDS that is a favorable mutation, SF3B1. And just to make it easy, Ashwin just picked a simple SF3B1 mutation. So there's no co-mutation. There's no other kind of complicating factor. So this is truly what we would consider low risk MDS, either by classical risk assessment or more molecular based uh, risk assessment. If we have a lower risk MDS patient, I would say the focus of lower risk MDS is really to improve symptoms, improve the underlying cytopenia. Um, those patients typically live very long. So, you know, the primary goal is not to, to, uh, to improve their survival. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there for a second. And I know we have a lot more to talk about, but that's kind of how I approach a patient um, initially. Sure, sure. Thanks, Max. Um, so one other thing I want to discuss up front is um, we see a variety of uh, low-risk MDS patients who have anemia as the main cytopenia. One patient who is like transfusion dependent and they are referred to you after, you know, briefly on transfusion support or ESAs. Um, and there are patients who are non-transfusion dependent um, but they have hemoglobin in the range of 8 to 9, like our patient, who are symptomatic. So I think I want to first clarify what is the definition of transfusion dependency. Because if you look at the literature, I think there's various definitions. And a lot of the times I see the fellows uh, and the trainees getting confused. What is the definition exactly? Maybe for our listeners, if you can clarify, how do you define transfusion dependency? Sure. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And actually, it's not a very easy question because this is not an objective measure at all. So it's not like we're measuring blasts. Not that blasts are the most objective thing, but let's let's say for now they are. Um, or a mutation. That's probably one of the more objective things we can measure. Transfusion dependence really is heavily weighted by the decision of the physician and the patient to get a transfusion. You know, and I just give you an example. You know, there might be um, people in my department who have a patient in front of them and they give them transfusions only if the hemoglobin is less than seven. So a more restrictive transfusion policy. There might be other colleagues who give a patient a transfusion if the hemoglobin is less than eight. And that decision might be weighted by multiple factors. So it could be that one patient is elderly, has some cardiac issues, and they want to keep the hemoglobin a little bit higher. Um, there are also just very practical issues. Uh, we have patients from Maine or New Hampshire and they don't want to come all the time back for transfusion. So somebody might decide to give them a transfusion to allow them to have some time off transfusions, even before that transfusion would technically be necessarily medically. So, and then lastly, the patient. I have patients who tell me, you know, who are very fit and, and they say if their hemoglobin is less than eight, they really need a transfusion. Otherwise, they not feel good. So, so I think there's a lot of like subjectivity into it. And this has plagued a lot of the clinical trials as well. And I think we'll talk a little bit about that later when we talk about the clinical trials, how transfusion dependence and independence is uh, defined. Um, I typically say if a patient gets transfusions, we say then they're either non-transfusion dependent, low transfusion dependent, or high transfusion dependent. And there are criteria in the IWG 2018 uh, for that, which I usually use, which uses a, a, assesses the number of transfusions one gets over 16 weeks, and then looks at how many those are and classifies uh, people based on that. But you don't get around in either one of them with the subjectivity of like who decides that a patient gets a transfusion. 
And is it important to distinguish heavy transfusion burden versus low transfusion burden? Yeah, Why it I is think important? It, I think it is. I think it's critically important. It may be a little bit less for the day-to-day -day care, but it's certainly very important for clinical trials. So, you know, I, I, I give you one um, very prominent example, I think, of a clinical trial, just where this really played into. If you think about the Matterhorn trial, you know, that looked at um, Roxatostat, um, that is a negative trial, was a negative phase three trial. Um, and we all think in the MDS field that the drug is probably quite active, you know, and the, and the, and the trial itself was not designed as well because it included patients who were very, with very, very low transfusion burden. And if you include patients with very low transfusion burden, but transfusion independence is your endpoint, um, then you run into the issue that the patients in the placebo arm might have a very high transfusion independence rate. And that's exactly what happened in that trial. It was very hard to show a difference between the interventional arm and the placebo arm because a lot of patients were already very close of not needing transfusions. So once they went on trial, they uh, became transfusion independent with placebo and that really hurt the trial. So I think for those um, um, things that is very important. Um, and then also it's important to, in order to predict like how well a patient will respond to different therapies. That's more, I think, in standard clinical practice. Okay. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Um, I think moving on to the treatment, I think we can safely assume we have three drugs in this space to treat. So let's go by each drug. I think the first is erythropoietic stimulating agents, which have been approved for MDS for a long time. So is there a particular EPO cutoff you use in the clinical practice to consider ESAs for patients with lower risk MDS with an EPO? Sure, yeah. So I think most clinical trials look at EPO cutoff more than 500 and less than 500. However, I would say there is some gradation with that, you know. So if you look at the early studies, um, the first paper published by Eva Halström um, from Sweden, um, she did this very nice analysis where she looked at transfusion burden, what we just discussed, and she looked at EPO level, and she classified the EPO level more than 500, 2 to 500, and less than 200. Um, and, um, and then based on that, uh, developed a score to predict how well patients would respond to an ESA. And really what you can see is that with less than 200, you have a very good chance of response to ESA. Two to 500, that's kind of in the middle, not great, but not terrible. And more than 500 really doesn't work. So when I see a patient, usually if it's less than 200, I get excited about it, about using ESAs. Two to 500, I think already about alternatives. So less than 500, I keep my fingers away from ESAs. All right. Um, and there are two agents right now. There's dabipoitin and ipoitin alpha. Uh, is there any differences among these ESAs? Yeah, there is a difference in how often you have to administer the agents. And I think that's important for patients. Epoitin alpha is administered weekly and um, ARNS or darbipoitin alpha is administered every two to three weeks. Um, that makes a huge difference to patients, particularly if insurances, and this is different based on different insurances and where you live, whether they allow the patients to take the EPOT at home. So for example, Massachusetts, not many patients that actually insurance covers that. So we have to do it in clinic. So you can imagine for somebody having to come to clinic weekly versus every three weeks makes a huge difference. Otherwise, I don't think there's any difference in the efficacy of those agents. When you initiate treatment with ESAs, is there a particular target hemoglobin level you're looking for saying that I want to achieve this particular hemoglobin level for patients who are on these agents? Yeah, not a, I wouldn't say a particular hemoglobin level, but I would like to keep them transfusion independent, you know, mm -hmm. um, if they are not transfusion dependent yet or, or make them transfusion independent. Um, and then to a level where they really are not sim as, as symptomatic. But I always explain to patients, it's very rare to normalize hemoglobin. In fact, I've never seen this with any of my MDS patients with ESAs alone. You know, when you start them, when they have already a quite low hemoglobin or they're transfusion dependent, you barely ever will completely normalize their, um, their hemoglobin. So it's important to set realistic expectations, I think, of what you can do and not. Yeah. And um, one of the question about ESAs, and I've seen different opinions among different clinicians, there is some data to add GCSF to ESAs to get uh, increased response. Have you done that in your practice? Do you support this particular usage? 
Yeah, I honestly, I, I've say, I agree with you. There is this data. I have not done that a lot, mainly because we have alternatives now, you know, mm -hmm. so when, patient, when patients don't respond to ESAs, despite using them correctly, that's maybe one important point I want to make, you know, um, I see quite a few people who are on ESAs and they are on doses that might work in chronic kidney disease, but they're not on doses that work for MDS. So for example, for MDS with EPOID and alpha, you know, you really have to go to 60 to 80,000 units per, per uh, week, which is much higher than what is used routinely, you know, for CKD patients. So, but if it, if, if people use it correctly, I would say, then I typically do not add GCSF. I rather move to another agent. Yeah. yeah. Um, with that, let's move on to the next agent, which is Lospartacep. So there were two clinical trials. I think before we talk about these two clinical trials, I think just for our lis listeners, how does Lospartacep work? Yeah, so Lospartacep is, uh, um, is eliminating the bad humors <laughs> in blood. <laughs> to say it in a very simple, simplified way. So, I like so, that. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I tell my patients. Um, so what it does, it's um, it's a fusion protein actually, and it um, uh, one part of the fusion protein is just um, the FC fragment of IgG, and the other part of the fusion protein is almost like a baseball glove that catches TGF beta um, family ligands, which are very important in the microenvironment of MDS cells. Um, and they lead to ineffective um, um, hematopoiesis. If those are blocked, they don't bind to active end receptors. That's, that's where they would usually bind to. And with that, you suppress SMAT signaling pathway, which is upregulated in MDS, but also in myelofibrosis. Um, that's why those paracept is also um, explored in, 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 in that disease. And with that, you get uh, more effective um, um, hematopoiesis. With that, let's first talk about the medalist trial. Um, which is a phase three randomized placebo-controlled trial, which enrolled transfusion-dependent lower-risk MDS patients with ring citroblasts that are refractory or unlikely to respond to ESAs, so which are patients with EPO level more than 500, as you alluded earlier. And the primary endpoint for this trial is transfusion independence for at least eight weeks for our listeners explain the results of the medalist trial and then we can talk about some of the critique about medalist trial. Sure, yeah. So in the medalist trial, I think uh, just a couple of comments, you know, this was, um, this is still the e old endpoint of, of transfusion independence of eight weeks in the IW 2006. I think we'll talk a little bit about that, maybe Ashwin, but that's what they used. Um, and, and they compared it to placebo. They were better, you know, so about, uh, I think, 35 Forty percent in that range became mm -hmm. transfusion independent with uh, with loose patercept, and that was better than um, than placebo. Um, also, it was not zero in placebo again. Pointing out, you know, my, the point that I tried to make earlier that you know if you include patients with very low transfusion burden, you might get a high placebo rate. But it was only like about fifteen percent or so with a with a with a placebo arm. So um, so it was better in in that sense. If you look a little bit further out, so you give patients more time where you observe them, whether they remain transfusion independent, so 16 weeks, 24 weeks, that number uh, went down quite quickly, you know, um, 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 but it met its primary endpoint and it was approved based on that. One thing I wanted to point out is um, these patients were transfusion dependent at the time of enrollment, um, but one thing I noticed that patients who are high transfusion burden at baseline did not have a good response with Do you Can you maybe speculate why that could be the reason why these patients do not respond? Yeah. As much yeah. as the low transfusion burden patients. Yeah. So, you know, patients with worse disease respond less. Yeah. <laughs> That's a simple explanation of this. You know, so transfusion burden is a great marker of how bad your disease is because it directly reflects how much hematopoiesis is going on in the marrow. Right. You know, and there are other markers of badness in disease, how complex the disease is, what co-mutations you have, you know, what the clonal complexities of disease. But in the end, you know, measuring output in the bone marrow is a great way of saying like how 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 far along the disease is and if you have high transfusion burden in generally responses are less you know um, um there are some agents where this might be a little bit less the case which i think we'll discuss a little bit later but um 
but in general, patients do worse if they if they have a higher transfusion burden. And that was definitely the case in in this subset, you know, of 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 patients. You're right. Yeah. And before we talked about the commands trial, which is in the frontline option, um, why does lospartacept work so well in MDS patients with ring pseudoplasts? Is there any mechanistic yeah. explanation for that? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure somebody has some hand wavy explanation. Um, I have not seen a very convincing explanation. You know, we always think that SMAT signaling is upregulated in, in those SX3B1 mutated cases, maybe a little bit more than SX3B1 wild type cases, but but there's no direct cutoff, right? You know, how much signaling you need in order this drug to be active. Um, so no, I, I don't have a fantastic explanation for that, but this has been persistently seen that this agent works better. And that's why the, the medalist trial at least was entirely focused on this subpopulation based on, on, on earlier trials. You know, I think one thing to say about SF3B1 in general is that in general, it's, it, this disease is better prognostically, right? You mm -hmm. know, so, so, so agents in general do a little bit better in, 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 in this subset um, of disease. Less clonally complex, you know, might be a little bit more one one isolated mechanism of anemia. So so a drug that targets that particular pathway has maybe a better chance of working. So now talking about the COMMANDS trial, which is a frontline trial, which is a, once again a phase three randomized trial in which patients with non-Delphi Q, lower risk MDS who were naive to ESCs and transfusion dependent uh, were randomly allocated to receive either EAC or lospartacept in the frontline setting. Um, the trial, we saw the interim results uh, published in Lancet, and most recently, the first analysis was published in Lancet Hematology. And the primary endpoint of the clinical trial is both the 12-week period of transfusion independence as well as rise in hemoglobin concentration by at least 1.5 grams per deciliter. So there is a difference in the primary endpoints between medalist and commands trial, um, probably because this is the um, upfront clinical trial. And this trial accrued 363 patients um, and it achieved its primary endpoint uh, with 60% in the lospartacept achieving the primary endpoint versus 35% uh, in the important group. And the median duration of RBC transfusion independence was 126 weeks in lospartacept arm versus 89 weeks in epoitin alpha. Um, I think one thing surprised a lot of us was that there was no difference between RS negative subtype versus patients um, between lospartacept versus um, epoitin alpha. Uh, but irrespective of these results, DA approved it broadly. So, Max, I want to hear your take on this. Uh, what do you think about COMMANDS trial? Are you convinced that we should use all patients with low-risk MDS and uh, lospartacept in the front line? Yeah, so maybe some comments about this trial. This is a perfect example of a very smartly designed trial, you know. So and 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 a couple of features of like how they designed this trial very smartly. Number one is the endpoint they chose, you know. So um, as you said, it's kind of an endpoint that is not actually an official endpoint, you know, or official <laughs> response, you know. But um, but they used twelve weeks, so longer time, right, to really make sure, you know, they they figure out are there patients who benefit longer, and this makes sense in the frontline setting, right, where you are expected to have better responses. Um, and they combined it with a hemoglobin increase, you know, and I think that is very important because um, I mentioned before the Matterhorn trial where they didn't do that, and you might have a similar, you know, transfusion independence rate, but making sure you combine that with actually an increase in the hemoglobin, you really get people who uh, don't accidentally, somebody decides that to this week, I'm not gonna give it blood transfusion, right? And hence they became transfusion independent. So you take a little bit of that uh, subjectivity of the blood transfusion out of the picture. And I think that helped the trial. Number two is um, they included both patients, right? SF3B1 mutated and vial type or ring zeroblast positive and negative patients. Um, but, but they did not make this a pre-planned kind of like clear analysis, right? However, they, however, naturally, because those patients are the anemic patients, 
the population was stacked with SF3B1 mutated patients, right? So two thirds of the patients were SF3B1 mutated. Do you yeah. think that is the patients who are referred to the trial um, were biased because of the, the data we already generated from the medalist clinical trial? Do you think that's the yeah. reason why, like historically, mm-hmm. if you look at all comers with lower risk MDS, 70% are RS negative and only 30% are RS positive. But right. in all the trials, we see that there is a huge overrepresentation of RS positive. So, yes. what is the reason for that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, I I think definitely plays into a role that people knew about that signal with uh with those patterns that being active in SSV1 mutated patients. But there are also other reasons. I think, uh, you know, one is that those patients are has particular and isolated issues. Usually, isolated anemia, and the anemia can be quite severe. And those are the patients who are, might be more willing to go on clinical trials because they really see this as a major issue. Um, in any way, it worked out greatly for this trial, right? You know, because um, if, you de- if you deck your trial population with a population you know benefits, but you don't restrict it to that population, that's honestly the best thing that can happen for a trial. And that's what happened, right? You know, and you mentioned that the approval was broad, and that was based on because any subgroup analysis was unplanned, you know, and hence, you can't say that, you know, there is not any clear benefit in even the RS negative group, you know, um, whether we as clinicians think that this warrants a loose powder step use in that group, I think we can discuss it in a little bit. But, um, but anyway, that's what the regulator thought. And as, so it's a, it's a good example of a trial that's well designed to get the result you would want. Yeah. Uh, that's a good point. Um, maybe briefly mention about the adverse events reported in the clinical trial, especially if in the Luspartacep arm. Yeah, so I think, you know, um, there was, uh, this is this is, has been observed on multiple Luspartacep trials now. It's probably the side effect that I think is the most bothersome for patients is this fatigue, you know. Um, and it's it's actually very hard to understand this because this fatigue is not always correlated with anemia, you know, so we have patients who we put on this paracept, they get more fatigued, although they have a hemoglobin response, right? Yeah. So objectively, as a physician, you tell them, why are you more fatigued? You know, like your hemoglobin is improving. And the patient says, no, but I feel more fatigued. And this is not subtle sometimes. Um, yeah. So um, I talked actually with the company about this, you know, and, and they tried, they went at great length uh, because they did a lot of cytokine profiling on their trial to try to figure out why that is, you know, but they couldn't figure it out, you know? So the, of course, it's not a very super common event on the trial, and um, but there's no clear signal biologically why why that would be, you know, whether some other cytokines are upregulated that would make somebody more fatigued. But that's definitely a thing. There was a little bit higher thromboembolic events, I think, on the trial as well, but I have not seen that with my patients that I've treated. But the fatigue is definitely something that we see in clinical practice. And that has led to some patients stopping the drug, although they have actually objectively benefited from it. I think one thing we have not seen so far is the quality of life metrics from the commands trial. Yes, it improves hemoglobin. Yes, it achieves the primary endpoint, but does it improve the quality of life? I think that is something we have not seen at all. Um, Another thing I wanted to highlight is do you think that losparticide fundamentally has a disease modifying potential? Because right now everyone is talking about disease modifying potential. I think maybe it's worth mentioning about that. All right, Ashwin. If you really want to rev me up, then let's talk about disease modifying potential. <laughs> it's a magic word in hematology, you know, <laughs> and. Uh, and everything is disease modifying if you talk to drug companies, right? You know, every cytokine that goes down is in, is direct evidence that something is the disease modifying. So no, so in short, I don't think we have any evidence that this is disease modifying, right? You know, even with imperfect measures. So like the typical imperfect measure that people use, and I think we'll discuss that with Imitelstat a little later, is a, a variant allele fraction or clonal size reduction over time on treatment, you know? And if patients have a clonal size reduction, they might have a disease modifying effect. I have a lot of issues with that marker, but um, but but needless to say, you know that was not really observed with those paracepts. So um, no, so I don't think it has a disease modifying effect in that sense. But it is modifying um, um, for patients. You know, if they don't require transfusions, it, I you know going back to the quality of life aspect, you know that's another problematic thing. How do you measure this, right? When do you 
measure it? At what time do you measure it close to a dose? We just said this Paracept can make some people fatigued. If you measure this at like at the end of the dose, you might actually feel better. If you measure it early, you might feel worse. Do you measure it before or after a transfusion? Before or after they have been in the waiting room for two hours and are crumpy about it? You know, so it's it's a very imperfect measure. But I think transfusion independence, particular in the commands trial to say something really positive about this, was long lasting. You know, so patients really benefited for a long time if they benefited. And I think that makes a huge difference for patients if they don't have to come to transfusion. This was a little different from the medalist trial, right, where the where the benefit weaned quite quickly over time. That was not the case in the in the in the commands treated patients. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask you, you know, we've talked about a little about transfusion independence, but how often do you see just a, a spreading out of the transfusions and that is enough? for patients to con want to continue on on the drug. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, you know, I I think transfusion independence is always a very tough point if you just see it as like continuous transfusion independence, right? You know, so I, I do think that patients benefit if they, let's say, get a transfusion every two, three months, right? One transfusion, they are technically not transfusion independent, right? If you measure the entire time period, but they still clearly benefit. And I think, you know, um, and, and of, of course, what the drug companies do is they, they add those time periods up, you know, and see how they're different, um, even if they're interrupted by, an, uh, by a transfusion here and there. And, and, and I do think that means benefit, right? You know, so um, 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 you shouldn't say like if a patient gets a transfusion, you know, every couple months that they don't benefit from this treatment. So I usually keep patients in my clinical practice on those patterns that even if they require transfusion here and there, as long as they don't like really become heavily transfusion dependent, right? Then you really lose the uh, responsiveness to the agent. Totally, yeah, no, thanks for clarifying. So if we move on and say a patient who was receiving Luspatacept in the front line responded, but now they seem to be losing their response, they've got a worsening hemoglobin and increasing transfusion requirements as you just described. Um, let's talk about the next line of therapy or next potential line of therapy. And in that context, um, in June uh, 2024, the FDA approved imatelstat uh, for adults with low to intermediate risk MDS with transfusion dependent anemia requiring four or more uh, red blood cell units over eight weeks who have not responded to a loss response to ESAs. So before we dive into the iMERGE trial, could you tell us a bit about imatelstat's unique mechanism of action? Yeah, so it does have a unique mechanism of action. Whether it really does what it does clinically through that mechanism, I think is a is a question for another day. But like very basically, you know, it works on on the telomerase. So so what is that? You know, what are telomeres? It goes back to like basic you know uh, biology and the the issue or the problem with end replication, right? If you have the replication fork, you know, the DNA polymerase can only go from five prime to three prime, you know, and so in the lagging strand, it has to go. It has to, uh, you know, always uh, put a new set of primers every couple periods. And at the end, the coding sequence would get shorter if we wouldn't have telomeres after each, you know, replication. Actually, a cell would have to undergo apoptosis if it undergoes 50 to 70 or so re replications without telomeres. That's why we have this capping sequence that's called telomeres. But the important thing is telomeres, you know, are shorter and they get shorter over time. That's why we all age. Um, in particular in um, MDS, where you actually have a lot of cell turnover, right? If you look at the bone marrow, and I think, you know, Ashwin showed the bone marrow of this one patient, uh, the report, although you have, you know, low blood counts or insufficient hematopoiesis, you actually have a hypercellular bone marrow. You know, it does not mean, you know, you don't have enough cell production. You actually have a lot of cell division. It's just not very effective in, 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 in producing mature cells, you know? So what we see in MDS patients is in their cells, in their, uh, you know, in their uh, precursor cells, that the, uh, that the telomere are shorter, um, um, but the telomerase activity, so the, so the enzyme that tries to prolong it back up as a consequence of that is upregulated, you know, compared to normal hematopoietic cells. That is great because it, it uh, gives you a therapeutic window, right, you know, um, that you try to um, use basically with, with this uh, drug, imitelsat, uh, which actually um, is, a, is, a, is a nucleotide that right binds to the, to the RNA part of the, of the telomerase and then blocks that enzyme in doing what it's supposed to do, so uh, uh, prolonging telomeres. 
And the thought is that because you have that vulnerability in, in, in um, MDS or MDS clonal cells, that you can selectively deplete those cells um, and, and, and hence improve the disease. That's at least how, how it's thought to work um, in, uh, in pictures, you know, and- um... yeah, How it's meant to work on paper. <laughs> yeah, it yeah, works yes. that way in real life. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. No, that was a great, great explanation. So um, the iMERGE trial, which recently came out in the Lancet, uh, was randomized phase three, double blind, placebo controlled uh, trial of 178 patients with low risk, lower risk MDS. Um, to either have imatelstat or placebo, and it was two to one randomization. Uh, and the primary endpoint, as we've talked a little bit about, was transfusion independence for at least eight weeks. Um, so, could you run us through the sort of top line results of the trial and what you thought of them? Yes, sure, of course. Yeah. So, again, this was a positive trial. You know, the trial met its endpoint. Um, it was, um, again, imetelstat versus placebo in those uh, patients, and 40% uh, or so became transfusion independent on the imetelstat arm. Again, some patients with placebo became transfusion independent, so, um, so it was not 0%. Um, there are a couple other things, you know, that that made this trial, I think, exciting in a way that like when we looked at the subgroups, we just went through those subgroups in the command study, right? The subgroups of interest are, you know, what happens with patients who are SF3B1 mutated versus vial type or RS positive versus RS negative. It didn't look at least with this, you know, with the number of patients they had that they could find a statistical significant difference between the response rates, you know, or transfusion independence rate between the groups. So that's encouraging for patients who are RS negative. Um, and then also they looked at the transfusion burden. There was not a huge difference between the lower and higher transfusion burden patients. Um, and again, um, responses were quite durable, right? You know, so I think this was important, you know, median duration, I think was 50, 50 weeks or so for imitalstat, you know, which is, which is quite encouraging for a population that got other agents or is ESA refractory, or has high EPO levels. So I think those were all the encouraging results um, of that trial. Yeah, and, and when they gave the breakdown at 16 weeks, it was you know 30%, 6%, 24 weeks, 28%, 3%, one year, 14%, 1%. So so just you know building on, on your last comment um, there. Um, how do you think that balances out with the toxicity and the the, the rates of adverse events? Because that's my sort of, as a non-myeloid guru, that's sort of yeah. my reaction to this trial. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, I mean, what leukemia doctor ever worried about leukopenia, right? And thrombocytopenia, you know, no, of course, this is a, definitely, I totally agree with you. This is a big, this is the big other part of that story, right? You know, I kind of told the positive part. The negative part is it definitely causes neutropenia. It definitely causes thrombocytopenia. And very importantly, patients who had baseline leukopenia, thrombocytopenia were excluded from that trial, right? So it's not your pancytopenic patient with a burned out marrow, you know, that uh, and now heavily transfusion dependent of red cells that you now give this drug when you make things magically better. Those were not the patients studied in this trial. So I think to your point, it's a very specific patient population of, again, isolated anemia patients. When the further patients move along in their treatment story, the less those patients get, right? The more they really become pancytopenic. So for those patients, it would be an issue. I think what the you know what they showed is that they had to reduce a drug in a lot of patients. More than half the patients had uh, drug dosing reductions, um, and with that, the effect was more limited to the first one or two cycles, and it got better afterwards, right? Um, but I would think this of of this drug a little bit more like an HMA, right, where you uh, have clear cytopenia in the beginning before things get better, and you have to sometimes dose reduce. Uh, very different from those patterns that where you don't really have leukopenia or thrombocytopenia, at least it's not that severe. And one thing that was a little bit surprising is that even though we see grade three, grade four, neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, but there are not many patients who have neutropenic fever or bleeding events, which we usually expect. Mm -hmm. I don't know why there is a discrepancy there. You see grade three, grade four, neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, but not translating into any other. Why yeah, do you think yeah. that is? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure, but you know, I I would say with with the neutropenia, sometimes you know, it's uh, we have sometimes baseline neutropenic patients in MDS who don't have infections, right? You know, 
So it really depends. Usually with neutropenia, when they really get infections, it's often when they get chemotherapy and you injure their gut and they get gut translocation and get neutropenic fever with that. You know, that imitalstat might do less than, let's say, an HMA or more intensive chemo or HMA plus venetoclax, right, where you can definitely get that. Um, so you might have more a number point, right, but less so that it translates truly neutropenic fever episodes. Less translation and translocation, perhaps. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Very nice. No, but that's that's a nifty explanation. I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that one when I'm talking with patients for sure. Um, uh, because uh, Ashman and I know you love to talk about it. What do you think about the disease modifying <laughs> potential of uh, imatelstat? All right, let's. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be a long discussion. So. Yes. Yeah, so what people claim with, with this drug that has disease modifying effect is that when you looked at the variant allele fre frequency of certain mutations, they did show that with SF3B1, I think they did show it with other splicing factor mutations as well, that they, they, that they do decrease over time with treatment and that that's somewhat correlated with transfusion independence. So meaning that the patients who had a decrease in the driver mutations, you know, um, they had um, you know, a higher rate of transfusion independence. There are some issues with that, right? Number one is they were often not reduced to zero, right? So we don't really know what delta is actually important, right? You know, and this is the same thing in the myeloproliferative neoplasm world with interferons, right? So let's don't talk about that for too long. But like, you know, if you don't decrease something to zero, what does it mean to go from 50% to 30%, right? You know, it's not entirely clear, you know? although they showed some correlation with clinical benefit with that. Um, so that's one. Number two, I think the second issue is a little bit how it's measured. You know? So if you measure a variant allele frequency in the peripheral blood and you look at uh, peripheral mononuclear cells, but you have leukopenia, you might actually decrease your VAF because of a side effect, less because of a, um, you know, because of a therapeutic effect. You know? And we just mentioned that a lot of patients on that trial had leukopenia and needed to have dose reductions because of that. You know? So um, because of that, I'm a little bit hesitant to say it's truly disease modifying and you know, patients will live forever because you know, their disease is eradicated. I think that just requires a lot more study you know, than, than what we currently have. Yeah, you're not going to be prescribing healthy people imatelstat to protect their telomeres, uh, uh, keep them living longer. Yes, absolutely. I mean, like, I mean, like, even thinking about you know that telomeropathies can cause MDS, right? You know, so so yes, I understand the therapeutic window that we just mentioned, but uh, but yes, healthy people, I, I you know, I, I wouldn't prescribe that to CCAS or CH patients quite yet. You know, it's, yes, I agree with you. Um, so the dose uh, questions is a little curious. The FDA approval is for 7.1 milligrams per kilo every four weeks, whereas the trial used 7.5 milligrams per kilo every four weeks. We talked about toxicity being important. Why is there that discrepancy between the approval and the trial dosage? Yeah, so so my understanding is that this is not... Um that this is not like a lowering of the dose because of toxicity, but rather it's just a quite a slightly different formulation. I think they're going to move forward in their approved product compared to the trial product. And in the end, the effective dose that they deliver is the same. So I don't think it's actually a, low, a, a much lower effective dose that's delivered. It's just a little difference in formulation. We talked about three drugs right now, ESAs. Um, we talked about Lospatacept and we talked about Emtelistat. So I think coming to the, how are you going to optimally sequence? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm curious to know your thoughts. How would you, you know, sequence these agents? And what yeah. are the um, you know, disease markers you would use um, in choosing which agent first? Yeah, so maybe let, let's start with the markers, you know, and what kind of to use as first line, then we can think about sequence and how that goes into that first line decision. So usually what I say, the markers you need is an EPO level, an SF3B1 mutation, and you need to know whether patients um, um, have a, a deletion of the long arm of chromosome 5, you know, so if they're 5Q minus. Um, so if they're 5Q minus, I give them a little mind, because for that one, we actually do know that they're disease modifying. Talk about disease modification, you know, we know that you get complete cytogenetic responses in those patients, right, who are 5Q minus and treated with a little mind. And we know from the, Rev, from the central REF trial for patients who are not transfusion dependent yet that you can actually delay their transfusion, onset of transfusion dependence for, for several years. You know? So I think that is a very good marker of that you actually do modify disease biology. Um, so I use that for the 5Q minus patients. Even for the patients who are SF3B1 mutated, 
with 5q minus. You know, then you one could technically use this powder sept as well, but I I, I prefer Revlimid in 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 those patients. So the, the next question is, you know, is if the SS3B1 mutated. If the SS3B1 mutated, I think this powder sept is first line agent. It, it clearly is better than than ESAs, you know. Know, both from transfusion independence rate as well as how long it lasts. So I think there's not much discussion there. If the SF3B1 wild type, you know, I think that's where like most of the discussion currently is. That's where I use the EPO level. You know, if the EPO level is low and I see, you know, they are very likely to have a response to EPO. So really those patients with EPO level less than 200, I, pref I still prefer EPO because I don't think there's any evidence to show that it's worse than those Paracept, it's certainly cheaper. So that's why I use it in those patients. But in patients who are SF3B1 um, wild type and have a high EPO level more than 500 or are quite transfusion dependent, have, a, have quite a high transfusion burden, I also use this Paracept in that setting. In terms of sequencing, you know, I think if they're, if they're EPO first and the SF3B1 mutated, they get this Paracept next, you know, otherwise they would, uh, they would get imitalstat, you know. Um, um, I typically, you know, the question is like, if somebody's SF3B1 mutated, they didn't get Luzparacept yet, should they get Luzparacept or Imitalstat? Both would be reasonable, right? You know, because Imitalstat could be given independent of SF3B1 status. But be, just, just because of the side effects that we mentioned, the leukopenia and thrombocytopenia, I usually like to go with something that has less side effects if I can help it, you know? So in the mutated SF3B1 mutated patients, a uh, second line, I, I use this powder set, otherwise in the So um, I think moving on to the last question of our, our discussion is, what are the valid endpoints in clinical trials for a lower risk MDS? I know we talked about the transfusion independence and some of the caveats associated with it. I think you eloquently mentioned that, what is the threshold for transfusion? Some physicians use seven um, because of the limited resources of blood, blood products, as well as some physicians using eight as well. And there is data showing that, you know, the, the patients who have hemoglobin less than eight versus see, between eight to nine, they have a different survival and they are more symptomatic and things like that. So is, is still a valid endpoint given all these caveats which we talked about? The endpoint of transfusion independence, basically, yeah. So, yeah. so, so I think from looking at all of the trials, I think it is valid. You know, I think looking at transfusion independence, this is meaningful to patients, right? You just have to make sure that it actually is meaningful, right? You know, mm -hmm. eight weeks of transfusion independence is probably not meaningful. That's two months. You know, that's uh, that's uh, very short for like you know uh, for getting uh, a drugs approved. So I think you know, twelve weeks or ideally sixteen weeks, I think is a better endpoint. I think it should always be combined with a delta in the hemoglobin, you know, because um, because otherwise, you really have to restrict your trials only to heavy transfusion burden patients, um, particularly in the randomized setting, right? With the caveats that I mentioned, that otherwise your placebo arm is going to have a very high rate of transfusion dependence, and I think that's very bad because you lose out on um, on very active drugs that 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 would be good. So I think it should always be coupled with a hemoglobin increase. And the, and the duration should be mandated to be longer, you know? But I think if you combine those two and you don't do what, the, let's say, Metalist or, um, you know, or, um, or I merged it with eight weeks, you know, without increase of, uh, of, of, of hemoglobin, I think, I think then it's still a quite valid endpoint. Also because we don't have anything better, right? You know, um, I would not make SF3V1 mutation VAF reduction the new endpoint, you know, before we have any benefit with that, at least with transfusion independence, we know it translates to benefit that patients have, right? That they don't have to get transfusion, they don't get iron overloaded, et cetera. Um, any other endpoints you would add, Max, apart from which we already talked about in your yeah. ideal clinical trial design? Yeah, so in my ideal clinical trial design, I would definitely, you know, put a lot of emphasis on exploratory endpoints, you know, but I would not claim that those should lead to the approval of a drug, you know, but I do think things like looking at the clonal burden of disease, right, I think is very important and not just by simple measures such as like VAF reduction of one single gene. We all know MDS is a polyclonal disease, right, you know, and there are many driver their passengers' mutations. And I think that is actually very important to look at, particularly when we claim things like disease modification, um, to look at that in the correct way, you know, and not just by VAF reduction of a single gene. So 
you know, so, so those techniques are obviously very expensive and they're all explore, exploratory, but thing, uh, but even things like sequential single cell sequencing, I think gives you a much better resolution of what's going on in the bone marrow, right? But it's not something I would say drugs should be approved based on, on, on that endpoint. And then lastly, you know, patient, um, uh, patient reported outcomes, you know, um, this is always this thing that's a, that that's, you know, everybody says to, to do it. And, you know, <laughs> it's always an afterthought in the clinical trial reporting. I think how we do patient reported outcomes probably needs to be better, you know? So we really need to do what like people do with their Apple watches, right? You know, report symptoms when they happen and not report them only like, you know, now you come to clinic and you try to look back what happened the last month, right? You know, it's just a very inaccurate way of reporting symptoms. And I think those kind of more real time reporting will probably be important, but those things are difficult to do, right? Both single cell sequencing and get, and get everybody an Apple watch is not the simplest thing to do for clinical trials. So, so I think, you know, um, but that's probably where the, where the field will move towards um, in the next couple of years, I think. I, I really like that idea of having the simpler or more, um, yeah, simpler endpoint as the primary endpoint, but then backing it up with the secondary endpoints, both kind of clinical and scientific, because, you know, often um, talking, I, I do a lot of stuff in sort of regulatory world and talking with people who aren't clinicians, it can be hard for them to distinguish between the drugs that really work and the drugs that don't. And I, I, one of the things I often talk about is if all of the endpoints line up and point in the same direction, then that's much more encouraging than when some endpoints go one way and some endpoints go the other way. So I, I really like that sort of series of endpoints that you painted out, out together at, uh, where you hope that they're all pointing in the same direction. You say, well, look, you know, the regulatory endpoint was great. The scientific endpoint was great. And the clinical endpoint was great. This is a drug we should be using, um, using in the clinic. So I, I, yeah. I really like that where you put that together. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. And, and, and also not to be too uh, much of a slave to, you know, you know, the magic P value, you know, like, you know, something needs to be less than this. And I know for regulatory approval, this is important, right? But it doesn't mean we have to give up on drugs that might be very promising, right? So for example, the HIF alpha, you know, stabilizers like, you know, Ruxatostat, I still think this is a promising drug, you know, and it might actually work, you know? So uh, particularly if you have have, like you said, endpoints that all point in the same direction that actually the drug does something, right? You know, in those cases, I would, I would, you know, try to design the trial in a way that you get a meaningful answer. And if the answer is no, right, as you said, if the endpoints just don't line up, then that's that, right? And we shouldn't, you know, develop drugs like that further. But if there's promise, I think we should develop drugs because in the end, people still uh, become resistant against agents, right? You know, although their duration is longer, it's not that long, right? I mean, you just pointed out like how on Metalist and iMerch, you know, if you look at just 12 weeks, 24 weeks, your rate of transfusion independence just drops quite quickly, you know, and those patients can live for years. So they need active agents. Thanks, Max. This was a fantastic discussion and I'm sure our listeners are going to love it as well. And uh, thank you for your time. We look forward to having you again on our podcast in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the invitation. I think we should just do a podcast about disease modification. <laughs> <laughs>